Welcome to the Real Estate and Wealth Podcast, your go-to resource for navigating the world of real estate investing and wealth creation. This podcast is brought to you by Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation, your trusted, caring, and responsive short-term mortgage lender in Alberta and Ontario. We explore strategic and tactical solutions to elevate your real estate portfolio, drawing insights from seasoned Canadian investors and trusted advisors. In each episode, we dive into various aspects of real estate investing, including market trends, property analysis, financing strategies, risk management, and much more. Whether you're a seasoned real estate investor looking to expand your portfolio or a beginner taking those first steps, this podcast is for you. Hello, everybody. In uh, this next episode, we have an extremely interesting gentleman in business. Uh, proud to bring you Rohit Gupta of Rohit Communities. Uh, Rohit, tell us a, a bit about yourself and what you're up to and what the company's up to. So, uh, Jesse, first step, I, I get the chance to connect, correct you. It's not Rohit Communities, it's Rohit Group. Rohit Communities Rohit is one of group. our divisions, but that's okay. Uh, hey, dude, uh, we're family enterprise. We started in 86. My dad uh, started buying apartment buildings when he was living in Libya and working for an oil company as a side on side hustle. Uh, over the years we've grown, we were we went into Fort Mac, we went into Kelowna, we eventually left those two markets. And today our enterprise is set up in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario. Uh, we build uh, 1,400 units a year now. Uh, we have over 1,200 acres of raw land in Alberta. We're in the retail development business. We're in the office business. We're in the healthcare business. We're in the residential rental business. And uh, we've got a spin out called Build Base also. Uh, so we've got a, quite a few different businesses uh, all underneath the Road Group umbrella. Super cool. Super cool. So, so, and today you guys, if I'm correct, are, are in growth mode. You're you're looking for new innovative opportunities to help support uh, Canadians and and uh, and 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 whether it be on the residential side, whether it be I think you're doing some work in health in the healthcare space. What I'll call it strategic or or innovative focuses are are, are you guys working on today? Yeah, yeah. So uh, kind of backstory, like when. We started, uh, sorry, in 2014, when the oil butt went bust, uh, we divested out of Fort Mac and we repositioned the company to go eastward. Uh, so that was a big strategic play we started running down. Uh, roughly around 2017, 2018, we started running into the rental business uh, because we started seeing tail uh, tailwinds or headwinds against the condo business, but uh, a lot of tailwinds developing with CMHCs financing project product out there at that time is the 40 year mortgage stuff. And in 2020, we entered actually into the healthcare business with a partnership with Covenant Health. Uh, but since 2014, where we got rid of ha closed down half our business, which was up in Fort Mac to where we are today, uh, we've taken our AUM uh, from about, I think it was about 400, 450 million at that time to about $1.2 billion of AUM today. And we're marching towards about a, uh, $2 billion by 2030 uh, is what our target is today. And so uh, the two key pillars or two key items that we're looking at today uh, to help us get to that AUM is working in the rental business side of it. Uh, and we're doing some really interesting things down there uh, and we're exploring some really interesting things. Um, and then the second item is looking at the healthcare business uh, where the partnership we have set up with Covenant Health uh, effectively gets us to start looking at government not as a challenge that is losing money on projects, but are actually economic catalysts, and they should be rewarded for being economic catalysts for some of the stuff there. So happy to explore any of those things that you want to talk about, but uh, those are two really distinctly different, but not mutually exclusive items that we're talking about. So I think we should get into both. Um, so maybe... Maybe we'll start with on on both of those endeavors, the rental and the healthcare. You guys are doing everything from early stage brownfield all the way through build, and then you'll take on ownership of the asset at completion as well. Yeah, so that's a yes and a no question, I guess. 
uh, it's, it, it requires a little bit of creativity. So maybe what I'll do is give a little bit more context. So the Covenant Health uh, Project, you can see a little bit of on the website called Covenant Wellness Community. Um, and what that is, is a project where uh, Covenant Health had an issue on about 75,000 uh, emergency patient visits were occurring at Grey Nuns for a facility that was designed for 25,000 emergency patient visits. And so they made the decision that they wanted to decant um, the Grey Nuns into a new facility. And so they had part of, bought a parcel of land uh, down in south, southeast Edmonton. We worked with them uh, through an RFP process and a subsequent process to look at that uh, ten acre parcel instead of just as a just as a hospital, we said let's re envision this to be a complete community where we bring in a, uh, a community health center, we bring in some medical retail, we bring in uh, some seniors facilities, we bring in some healthcare uh, residential, and we bring in commercial. So if you can imagine, their need was about one hundred and twenty one hundred fifty five thousand square feet at the time. Um, we ended up taking what was going to be one hundred fifty thousand square feet on ten acres. And turned it into a 600,000 acre development in partnership with them and with working and riffing off of each other. Um, right. What's awesome about this is um, right across the street, sort of, sorry, the first thing we did is we took down an old building, which is a Grant McEwen campus that had been, that was derelict. Um, and we were repositioned from 180,000 to 600,000 square feet. The second item is right across the street, we have a Millwoods Rec Center, we have two high schools. Uh, we have a neighborhood that hasn't seen any new rentals come into the marketplace for over 20 years. Uh, we had a new LRT system that was uh, built about a thousand kilometers, uh, one kilometer away, a um, thousand meters away, that would give us the ability to be considered a TOD development. We had a, a mall by the name of Millwoods Town Center that had gone dark over the years. And so we are acting like an economic catalyst of real town center building in that neighborhood. Right, right. The beauty of Covenant Health is that they have another arm called Covenant Care, which is uh, a seniors living uh, facil- uh, operator. And some of this stuff is for, pro- uh, for profit and some of it's for not for profit. They use the for profit side to help the not for profit side of their business. Mm-hmm. So they're looking at building on, on, this facil- on this site about 200 units of designated assisted living units. Um, and then we are working with them to build 300 res- residential rental units. Uh, those 300 residential rental units, we're going to look at as the uh, under the apartment construction loan program with CMHC, uh, which is effectively bringing in uh, market near market affordable housing to the to the to the community. Um, and then we use um, we're also working with them on bringing retail and uh, commercial retail that helps subsidize the ownership of the hospital or the healthcare facility. So the best way to look at it is both Covenant and Rohit are partners on different parts of the assets and the cash flow that is generated from these assets uh, for Covenant Health or this partnership goes to help subsidize the ownership of the healthcare facility. So now you have what we are creating a true P3, not just a partial P3 where we build an asset and we give it back to the government to run, we're actually looking at being long-term partners in some of these assets. And what happens out of it is um, the cash flow uh, or the investments that Covenant Health is making will help build their balance sheet for future investments. The balance sheet is going to help them subsidize current ownership of their assets, uh, of their infrastructure assets. And we're also taking on the agency of being a... Uh, a how do you call it, social entrepreneur or social pro, social yeah, pro, yeah. entrepreneur, but we're effectively working that environment, but we're working as a true for-profit entity. And so I would say this is probably the most innovative development space that we're working on in today's basis. That's so cool. So it's like you're, you're truly hacking that, that P3 world where it's not just, you know, one project done and s- split up the, split up the net revenue or profits. Yeah. and on to the next it's more sustainable and future planning but also in that it sounds like you know basically i don't know if it more like was it originally designed or did you iterate on that to get it to where your community building rehabilitating with a 
I guess at the beginning, it was a healthcare kind of a, a core idea around the healthcare piece. Like how did yeah. that even come to be? So I, I would say the way this, so the original, original strategy that uh, Covenant had had, I think it was, they purchased the lands. I'm going to make this up. This is a made up number, but I think it was eight to nine years ago, right? When they bought the lands, their intent was just to build a healthcare facility. And then we happened to interact, our group ended up interacting with Covenant Health over the years. And we said, oh, we, were, we weren't going to build a healthcare facility. We we're going to demolish the building. We were going to build a bunch of residential apartments and townhomes over there. And so we both looked at the piece of land, but completely differently. And so through those ideas that we happened to riff over, they took it back and uh, uh, they started engaging architects and brokers in the marketplace to give them some ideas and input so they could have their own vision that they interact, they created. And then they went to market with an RFP through the RFP process. Uh, when we, we being the winning proponent, our vision was actually similar, but dis, different, distinctly different than their strategy. And they were intrigued by that. Uh, where they wanted to reuse the existing facility that was on site, we said we we would rather tear it down to increase the density in the neighborhood. And right. so, if we look at if we listen to whether it's any municipality across Canada, they're all trying to figure out how to increase their utilization rates on their lands today. Our strategy was more in line with how do we make sure we reutilize existing infrastructure in our cities? How do we use, reuse the existing roads? How do we reuse the existing uh, sewer pipes and how do we drive more density through those? So I think that resonated a lot with the Covenant leadership team, and that's what helped us come to a partnership on this. Interesting. And then, so you're working with basically you got Rohit, you got Covenant, and then you have government. Um, yeah. So, so this is a okay. So. Uh, uh, the the way I would put it is we're the flea at like 200 people, 250 people. Then you've got like the cat, I guess, uh, that's on this, uh, that's like a 10,000 person uh, company. And then you've got this behemoth or this yacht that's a, that's 150,000 people, 100, 150,000, whatever the population is of the total pro provincial government, including HS. And all three of us have to interact with each other. The way this works is Covenant Health in, has, gets an operating license or an operating agreement with the government. And so, so Covenant ends up dealing with the provincial government. We end up dealing with Covenant. Uh, and, that, and that's how uh, that's how this arrangement works. So they worked with uh, Alberta Health to make sure they got the uh, the operating agreement to have the community health center. Then it was our, our job to make sure that we could deliver upon the needs of the requirements of the operating agreement and we could deliver upon um, uh, trying to reduce the cost of ownership for Covenant Health long term. And is Co is Covenant publicly traded? No, no. So this is the interesting. Covenant Health is the largest non governmental health agency in Canada. They're owned by the Catholic Church. Oh wow! Right, and so so it's, this is what makes it really interesting. So in our healthcare system today, here in Alberta, we have Alberta Health Services. That works for that works with Covenant Health in the marketplace. Uh, both of these agencies uh, provide all public health care that we are all interacting with. So up in Edmonton, Covenant Health would run Misericordia, Grey Nuns, um, and the Royal Alex. And uh, so, yeah. And so, and I have the lucky uh, lucky benefit of being married to a surgeon that works at one of the facilities. So I get I get all the intel on how hospitals work, or little tours here and there. Nice, nice. So the, the 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 project that we're referencing right now has it completed? No. So we're um, we're in phase one right now. Uh, phase one is watching uh, is having the community health center and all the site services being completed. The community health center we are anticipating will be completed in Q two of twenty twenty five, and then operationalized by Q four twenty five. Uh, so if there's a master class that anybody ever needs in how how hard it is to re to start up a building or operationalize a building, this is it, our facility is only 175,000 square feet, but it's going to take us six months to get the equipment running, the doctors trained, the nurses trained, the admin set up, 
and then running and practicing and doing dry runs or whatever it is that they do in their energy, uh, in their infinite wisdom. But uh, we are totally shocked as we're going through this process and this learning cycle of how hard it is to operationalize a hospital or a healthcare facility. No kidding. And this venture, is there anything similar to it in Alberta or Canada for that matter? Um, so, so it's, um, uh, I would argue from what I have researched, I have not seen anything like this in Canada. Um, what, what makes this unique is Covenant Health as an organization is, uh, actually very entrepreneurial, uh, um, and is taking, uh, took a bet with us from a development perspective. Um, to come in as a partner. So we're not a general contractor. We're a development partner. We're working with them as an owner's rep on the facility. What makes us unique is we have our own capital stack. We're a multi-asset uh, developer. So uh, we, we're integrated in terms of being able to provide the office, the retail, the residential, um, and the master planning that's needed from a land development perspective. Most entities in the marketplace um, don't have their own capital or are siloed out. So the multifamily guys are separate from the land development guys or separate from the office guys. Uh, we're a fully integrated team. Um, our development team is actually that plan the healthcare facility, also manage the land development and also manage the multifamily side. And so it's a very unique skill set that we have. Right. Um, and then what additionally makes it more interesting is the way we set up the legal structure of the, the site instead of having it as one joint venture agreement that would uh, supersede the whole site, all 10 acres and all assets, we subdivide it into multiple different legal entities or legal titles so that there could be bespoke solutions per, per uh, product type, per, per healthcare class. facility, per asset class, right. right? And why that's useful is from a government's perspective, they need to know that they have the ability to off-ramp a... Um, a partner that may be not behaving appropriately. They need to have a partner that they can is not going to bring ill repute to them. And they have to have the ability to defer decisions until the project is solidified. So what Covenant is using us is as a vehicle to go in and take some of the risks, do some of the pre-planning, which typically doesn't exist in government agencies. We can take that risk and we're, we're comfortable with that type of risk profile. Their risk profile... Um, is different than us in terms of long-term thinking because as a developer i don't know if i'm going to make money 10 years from now or five years from now right. they're thinking in 50-year increments so yes. so in 100-year increments so when they look at this facility they bring a ton of stability to us and they say look 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 even look the cost matters but the quality of the asset matters way more because we're thinking in a 50-year basis we need to make sure the generator system and the electrical systems and everything that goes into this building can last us 50 years and can lo has the lo longevity. So some of the short-termism that may exist in a typical developer, they help eliminate. The, some of the speed that is necessary, uh, we help bring to the table, uh, which they can't bring to the table. So it's like a, a grandfather walking with a grandchild. The grandchild's running and he's pulling the grandfather along, but the grandfather makes sure that the kid doesn't run into the road. Right. Yeah, and they yeah, both need yeah. each other. It, that's so interesting that even within the structure of the partnership, like you've kind of built it where effectively there are shotgun clauses throughout the various asset classes, which is brilliant because if like with this holistic approach you're guys using, if something happens to one piece, you could still maintain the other pieces without it spiraling, so to speak. Correct. Actually, yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yes, that is, that is exact. That's correct. Uh, and uh, what I, what I'd add, add Jesse is, we didn't set up shotguns. Actually, we gave um, in, in the traditional sense. So there's two places where the government needs to have the ability to off ramp with you. One is before the project starts, and sorry, three before the project starts, during the project, and after the project ends, right, right or the development phase ends, and you're in stabilization. Uh, and so most people from a developer standpoint uh, always focus on how do I exit the app relationship at a later date, right? Because they assume that the first part is going to go really smoothly. Government yeah. tends to focus on the beginning part from what I've seen. 
and less so on the back end, right? And so we needed to address both sides. So the way we've structured this is Covenant still owns the land. They they reserve the right to move ahead with whatever phase they want to with us as a partner. If they don't like mm-hmm. us, they can rip and replace us and bring in somebody else, right? Um, and so that's the risk for us is we're doing some work and the IP may leave with, leave with us, leave us. Right. And lots of developers or lots of partners that work with government are afraid. What if the government uses us? Right. And I, and I'm like, well, the government is here to be actually a good, en- good player or a good entity within society on general. Right. And so the government, the moment they start breaking relationships or reneging on promises will tarnish their ability to do business. So the likelihood that they're going to renege without a reason is largely limited from my perspective. As I, long as I would agree. Sure, right. It's a bit altruistic, but I would completely agree. Like everybody's yeah. interests align in a sense. And one success, one, one group success is a success of all. And I love, you know, this holistic approach you guys are taking. Uh, if, when you you execute and operationalize, it could be, uh, well, it, it, I, I would assume you would hope it would be a model that can be repeated. And, and it's great to hear that Alberta um, AHS is, is, is leading this from the standpoint of how do we bring in the private sector uh, to partner with, but uh, you would hope as we try to drive value in, in all projects that, that, that we do, uh, yeah. or that our government does, that they would consider this a really great opportunity to, to, to become more effective and efficient. So, so we're trying to right now, we're trying to work with, um, both covenant and Alberta health, um, right now to say, Hey, I, I, this is a, we believe this prototype, we being Rohit, uh, and covenant believe that this prototype that's being worked on in Millwoods town center is actually a solution that can be rolled across the province and eventually rolled across Canada. Right. Uh, yeah. Here's, here's why. Uh, and there are some other nuances uh, that, that come that are valuable, but if we go back to COVID, one of the biggest learnings we had is with these super hospitals is when a department goes down or let's say my obstetrics department has a COVID case, we had to take that that whole department down or we took that whole shift workout. And then you were worried about uh, the whole facility as a whole becoming a COVID positive or whatever it was. So right. to my, and my belief has been always, if you want to create redundancy, you have to have multiple facilities that are actually physically disjointed so you can pandemic proof yourself. So that was where the origination of this idea came from our side. The second aspect of this is uh, we built this on a 10 acre site with 300 rentals, 200 seniors, roughly an aggregate about, I believe, 75,000 square feet of retail, 125,000 square feet of community health center, um, and and the retail being medical retail and regular retail. We can take this uh, same project and put it to Northeast Edmonton. We can take it to mm-hmm. North Central Calgary. We can take it to Airdrie. But in let's just say a market like Calgary, there's an ability to take this from 10 acres to 40 acres. So why, if if we look at the Seton project down in Calgary right now, yeah. you, you have the super hospital, but the halo of that hospital doesn't extend to a 10 acre parcel. It is actually impacting roughly 500 acres around it, right? So why can't government that is plopping down a, a facility in Southeast Edmund, uh, Southeast Calgary, why can it not benefit from an uh, either increased revenue via taxation or increased revenue by participation in the business. So our argument was taxation shows that you're just rent seeking. Why don't you take the risk with us as a business and in the business and participate in the 40 acres? So they could be participating in single family profits and so forth, blah, 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 as an economic catalyst. But if you want to take the same project and you want to go to La Crete and you want to build a community health center, well, in La Crete, you may not have the population base to even support 50 rental units. Why can't we create this specific building, not as a community wellness center, uh, I mean, sorry, a, a community, uh, but just as a, uh, just a discrete asset, just discrete health center, we could sco- scope it down to that. You want to take it to Red Deer, not 10 acres, but you may take five acres. You might build a 150 unit rental building plus some seniors housing there. 
plus this uh, scaled down health center. So the business model, the way we've just, uh, developed it out, is something that allows scalability into secondary, tertiary, and primary markets. Yeah, it's 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 really smart, and it's it's funny that we don't like the government hasn't leverage like you called it a facility but really yes it's a facility but it's it's infrastructure it's an asset it's it's a, a draw right so so really you this this model is providing the government the ability to to leverage the investment yeah. like any hospital people want to live near or buy and people that want to live near or buy the hospital want retail, uh, people that live near and by the hospital, other people want to live by. So like being able to truly leverage the government's investment in the asset and think more broadly upon it is, is, is in essence of what this project is about. Yeah. So, um, here, here's another way to look at it. And this is this, so the U of A university of Alberta, and the Stollery Hospital up in Edmonton is dealing with the same problem that uh, University of Calgary did. So, but I don't think University of Calgary was thinking of what they did until they, it occurred. So the Stollery Hospital right now at the U of A is arguing that they would like to have a new facility right on Corbett Hall. Okay. Whereas about five kilometers away or seven kilometers away, uh, their uh, University of Alberta is developing 240 acres. Okay, now the Stollery Hospital could be relocated to that facility. Now that goes against what the government, uh, the doctors may want, what might be right from an operating room perform. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm ignoring all those issues. But the benefit for the U of A to have the Stollery Hospital not go on Corbett Hall, but go down all the way down to West 240 is the land that may be worth, let's say, 1.5 million an acre serviced out now may be worth three to four million dollars an acre. And it may create a long-term annuity for the University of Alberta, right? right? So yeah, if you yeah. think about the University of Calgary, what they did was they said, let's have our new children's hospital over here uh, near University District. And by the way, University District is going to coexist between the university and the university hospital or the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the children's hospital. Well, if you look at that neighborhood, it is the most happening neighborhood in all of Calgary. It is phenomenal. I, could, right? I, I went there for the first time during Stampede yeah. and it is absolutely vibrant um, from, from, from a density standpoint, from a retail yeah. standpoint, like it is happening and, and it's not, even, it's, it's far from the core right. um, yet they built, it's definitely live, work, play community where people want to be and they don't, you know, you can, you can, you can do everything within that university university district it's super cool now it's really unique in that it's on a land lease and a bunch of other unique components to it but uh but those are also innovative components to it well so but the land lease is yes it's it's weird it's unique whatever you want to call it we'll but call they're it not right we'll call it innovative but it's not prohibitive because the value that this hospital and the university is adding to that neighborhood is so high that people are willing to forego the, the objections, right? And so if, if we want to create truly sustainable institutions that are looking beyond um, their short-term needs or what their immediate needs are, uh, we need to start figuring out how to allow them to partner with us in business. So a perfect example would be this. Um, we were at a health conference. My team was at a health conference, and one of the guys, one of the guys, was talking about, "Oh man, we hit every single ESG target. We we solved every environmental issue on this hospital. We even went down to the point where we recycled the anesthesia gas, right? Uh, and yeah, and yeah. We're, we're, that's awesome. And we so, diamond all those all right, the check boxes, right? And then one of the guys got up and said. Um, I'm just looking at your design and uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how you handled transportation. How did you handle buses coming into the neighborhood? Right. And, and, and the, the, uh, the speaker from the health health authority sp spoke up and said, we didn't, that wasn't our problem. Our job was to take care of everything in the building. 
right? And so if we look at all institutions that we build them, whether they're libraries, schools, whatever it is, most of these guys are not thinking about how do I interact with the grocery? How do I interact with the neighborhood? How do I interact with the mother that's going to bring her stroller, kid on a stroller into my uh, after school care, whatever it is. Um, they're, everybody's talking about their facility, but they're not taking it from a master plan community. So the right. opportunity the University of Alberta has with its Dollary Hospital is to say, okay, not only are we going to put a children's hospital, but we're going to think like Patch Adams. Let's have a dog resort, right? Let's have a 10-acre or 5-acre dog resort where dogs can run around and play. But let's also bring a hotel in where people can sit here for long term as their kids are sick because the University uh, the Story Hospital is the catch basin for Saskatchewan. It is the catch basin for Northern Canada. It is the catch basin for Northern BC, right? And so you can actually have these people stay in long term with their kids, and then you can create some uh, retail right around it too. So now you've just gone away from just being a facility to a fully thought out master plan community in that mm-hmm. neighborhood, and you're and you're thinking about live, work, play, health as one entity. Yeah. So obviously. Rohit Group is really bullish on this, and and uh, uh, clearly it's an exciting time, and uh, and and uh, I wanted to get into your multifamily stuff, but maybe we just touch on it high level because uh, maybe we can have another episode where we talk about your rental yeah. stuff. But but so we we do you, do you think we sufficiently discussed kind of this? Uh, this this P three work you're doing, and how you're going about it, or do you want to add some more comment? Do you want to add some more discussion around that? I'll, Have we missed I'll anything? Add, yeah, I'll give you I'll give you one more comment, and then I'll segue to the affordable housing side, okay, or the the ho- rental housing side. This solution doesn't exist only for healthcare facilities. You can do this with libraries. You can do this with schools. You can do this with rec facilities, right? If you think about a school, it is an economic catalyst for a neighborhood. But we all build, a lot of us build single-story schools in our neighborhoods. Uh, Calgary's a little bit unique that way. They've, uh, Nenshi and those guys start talking multi-story hot schools. But why can't private developers come and develop and deliver schools that are integrated with seniors housing or integrated with uh, um, affordable housing or retail? Similar, story, similar argument for libraries and so forth. All these departments co- exist separately in municipalities. Uh, but what if we were start talking about infrastructure delivery in a uniform way with operating platforms existing separately within municipalities? So we're we're trying to broach the subject, not just with the healthcare facilities uh, or a health authority, but we're trying to engage this right across the board. My vision for our company is we move from Roweth Health to Roweth Infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And Roweth Infrastructure is delivering infrastructure across Canada and how, finding com- uh, cities and uh, towns creative ways to how to deliver these mechanisms. Yeah, it makes, it makes so much sense. And we go back or we go going back to that idea of governments investing in this infrastructure and it's this asset where people want to be near and around. So why not be really thoughtful about how to fully build it out and fully leverage that investment? I think, I don't know if this is a perfect parallel, but you look at now all these new uh, sports facilities and complexes and, mm-hmm. and ownership yeah. is being really thoughtful around the rest of the opportunity in and around these arenas. Like just like, like it happened in Edmonton. I, when was that? When was Rogers open five years ago? Yeah. Six, seven, seven years ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It's it's happening yeah. right now in Calgary. Like they, they are, they're being really thoughtful about how do we add value within the community and leverage people that want to be in and around this facility. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at stampede grounds just in general, like outside of the, even the arena, what the staff, uh, what Calgary's done down there with the BMO center and what they're doing with the hotels and so forth. Just brilliant. Love what Calgary's doing in the, in the core there. Yeah. Um, and so, so one of the things that, uh, and I would say when you start working with government or anybody who's doing it is we as a for-profit entity came in with the same bias no different than anybody else is going to come into it. We came in with how do we make for market housing? How do we come up with these solutions? But one of the things that's happening federal uh, across the country, you're seeing a stacking between the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipalities on trying to address their affordable housing solutions 
or how do we either create affordable or attainable housing? And what our group is doing is saying, hey, not only do we want to help you deliver these infrastructure assets, but we also need to look at housing as an infrastructure also. And mm-hmm. how do we help you deliver, achieve your objective? And each community has their own objective. Some are looking for a subsidized housing. Some are looking for near market housing. Some are looking for market housing. And, and the answer lies somewhere in between where all three of these have to be addressed. And, and so what our group is doing, like we are in Covenant, on the Covenant Wellness Community, we're, we're partnering with the Apartment Construction Loan Program to bring it to market. Uh, we're trying to work with some other NFPs here now in the city of Edmonton and saying, okay, how do we work with you to create uh, rental utilities or something that is uh, minimizes our need to rely on government to fund it in the future, right? So a perfect example would be over the years, we've looked at multiple neighborhoods and they're uh, the best neighborhoods are the ones that are heterogeneous populations and not homogenous populations. And so one of the projects that we're looking at is saying, let's say we have 200 units. Uh, let's assume that we're going to have about, and, and I, I'll call Jesse the NFP that I'm partnering with. So the NFP that Jesse is partners with us on a 50-50 basis. We assume that, let's say, 20 to 30% of the uh, individuals that will be coming into that facility will either be subsidized or will be on near market housing. So in that situation, um, when that renter shows up, um, he makes an application to Jesse, the NFP. The Jesse, the NFP may say, here, in your application, you're eligible for $800 a month rent subsidy. The market housing may be costing $1,500. The renter pays $1,500, $700 out of his pocket, $800 out of Jesse's pocket to the partnership. Jesse, as the uh, NFP, receives his 50% of the share, which would be 750 bucks out of the $1,500. And Rohit, as a for-profit entity, would receive $750 in his situation. Effectively, what you're having is Jesse spending, giving 800 to this guy, but getting 750 back uh, through the market housing rent. He's only yep. giving net, net $50. But he's also getting the market rent housing that he's getting on all the other neighbor, all the other renters. So the remaining 70%, he's getting free $750. And this is of course, ignoring the principal and interest payments and all that stuff. Right. 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 But uh, so effectively what we're trying to do is trying, trying to make it so that we can charge market rents. We can have the regular inflation, but then the NFP is able to attach the rent subsidy to the individual, not to the unit. Right. And, and that piece is around the opportunity. Well, the opportunities that are being created because of the situation that we've got ourselves in with the housing affordability issue. So, finally, all all levels of government are being serious about this. And you know, uh, what is it? Necessity creates necessity. Necessity is the mother, is the mother of, of invention. Invention. So, so as we're because we're in this in this in this supply, I won't call it a crisis, but, but we are, our, our levels of government are starting to be creative and solve this. And I, and I absolutely believe that it's going to be solved with partnering the right way with the, with, with the private sector. Yeah. And and I would say one of the big challenges that, um, so I, I, so this is a partly a government issue, like government needs to stack and needs to be aligned to solve the problem. This is a partly a pro- for-profit developer issue uh, where totally. the for-profit developer has to be willing to work with another agent agency with a different set of thoughts. And then the, it's an NFP issue uh, because they have to figure out how to get project delivery. So one of the issues that we've seen over the last decade, 15 years, working in this space loosely is that NFPs really struggle on project delivery. A, managing the costs of the de- uh, the project, but then actually pushing through the development challenges or the approval entitlement challenges that they have and constructability challenges. Where the problem for profit entities is, while we may be good at uh, maximizing revenue or providing a higher level of service uh, from a pure market perspective, we struggle at pr- providing the wraparound services that may be there to help subsidize the uh, market Subsidized, uh, subsidized individuals or near market individuals uh, could be mental health delivery. It could be drug addiction de- delivery. It could be um, uh, 
uh, food delivery. It could be immigration integration or uh, de- into society deli- delivery uh, programs. All these programming issues are not built into for-profit entities, right? And so this partnership really allows a entity like us to focus on project delivery and then allows the NFP to go into their core skill set and focus on program delivery and making sure that the other wraparound services are taken care of for the individuals that are coming into their units. It's leveraging each other's core competencies and strategic advantages, which usually results in the best possible outcome. Yeah. So, but it takes a lot of work. Like it takes a lot of patience to get through this. Super interesting. I don't want to keep us too much longer. We've talked about a lot of great stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think certainly we we should talk about more stuff because I know that uh, you're doing some really interesting things on the technology side. You've built a lot of really interesting things on the operational side. But uh, for today, in terms of what you're doing as it relates to uh, supporting projects with the public sector, how you are working on uh, multifamily as it relates to uh, building both both marketable and affordable spaces uh, is super cool. Anything, anything else we want to hit on before we bid adieu? Yeah, you know, um, for your investors or yeah, no, for your listeners, maybe there's one one thought I'd leave them with. Um, of everything I've been putting my thoughts into, I think there are going to be two key drivers over the next two decades for North America. Uh, or economic growth. And one is going to be AI, which we've all heard about ad nauseum uh, and, and justifiably. Okay. Uh, but I think the other key area for economic growth is going to actually be infrastructure uh, because we have to think of infrastructure not only in the sense of how we're going to do the energy transition, how are we going to warehouse our individuals that are coming through, like whether it's library schools, hospitals the subject matter that I've been talking about. But then there's basic other infrastructure like land titles and how do we digitize those assets or how do we take, how do we create uh, uh, trading mechanisms for uh, fleets of vehicles? How do we create online trading shops for automating or regulating traffic, uh, like trucking across the country? Uh, So that type of infrastructure, the I think for the next 20 years, whether you look at the U.S. or Canada, uh, are going to be the key investment themes where we should be looking at. And um, and I think those are where the most of the opportunities are. And that's how we're trying to orientate our organization. So today, you and I have been talking about infrastructure, uh, but AI or some stream of that, there's another aspect for our business, which you and I have talked offline previously, Jess, that yeah. that's going to that's gonna be a great investment opportunity, I think, downstream. So follow so so Rohit Group is following those two big trends. Yes. AI and infrastructure. Yes. And we talked a lot about infrastructure and AI plays uh, an incredible role into how we create it's it's just gonna create greater productivity. Yeah. Uh, but even on that energy transfer, like from what I gather, we have a we're creating a bigger delta on how we figure out this energy transfer because of the amount of energy that is needed for the AI evolution that we're probably the game hasn't even started. Like I couldn't even say we're in early innings with it yet, at least from my perspective. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this, the pension funds, they're moving. The big institutional investors are moving. Uh, they're, they're, they're already starting to deploy huge pools of capital into this, uh, whether it's uh, data centers, whether it's uh, uh, renewable energy, they're, they're trying to figure out how do we minimize uh, the computational requirements from an infrastructure, sorry, energy requirements due to computational requirements uh, caused by AI. Uh, and we haven't even seen quantum computers start landing yet to help mm-hmm. us drive this aspect. So I think uh, energy demand is going to skyrocket over the years. And we as a society are going to have be left with this choice uh, about do we want to allow data centers to be used for AI computational aspects or are we going to allow it to be used for blockchain? And are we going to allow our electricity to be used for blockchain and Bitcoin, uh, which are, I've got my own view of non-productive assets and, but yes, 
we talk about that later. Non-productive acids, greater, <laughs> greater fool theory. We'll get, we don't need to argue that on, uh, on, <laughs> Not today. Uh, on this episode at least. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So well, Jeff, awesome, Rohit. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for joining. And, and if like, uh, if people wanted to get in touch uh, with the group, learn more, talk more, uh, where, where would they go? You know what? Uh, easy place to, if you want to learn about our business, start, go to www.rowithgroup.com. Uh, but another place, just email me, rowith.rowithgroup.com. And we'll go from there. We'll start chatting, LinkedIn, reach out. Feel free to cool. and I and I know you. I think you guys are always looking for great talent, as are we. So, uh, if any of our listeners like reach yes. out, yes, we need talent. We need talent. To, uh, I want to. I want to. I want an empire that where the sun never sets. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'd like to. We'd love to have talent on our team that can help us uh, achieve our goals or partners that we can create some new value with. So awesome stuff, Rohit. Well. Enjoy your weekend. We're talking on a Friday and uh, three o'clock. Couple grinders still still at it. Yes. Uh, thank <laughs> thank you thank you. Oh hey dude, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Who'd have thought just that uh, little beer invite uh, a couple of months ago would have worked out so well for me? So I appreciate this opportunity, Jess. Awesome. That wraps up another episode of the Real Estate and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to hit that like button, share with fellow real estate enthusiasts and subscribe to stay in the loop on all upcoming episodes. Get in touch with the team at Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation by calling them at 1-888-752-4642 or email admin at chmic.ca. The opinions expressed in each episode belong to the individuals featured and do not represent the views of Calvert Home Mortgage. While we provide valuable insights, consulting with qualified professionals ensures that your unique financial circumstances are carefully considered aligning your investments with your long-term objectives. Calvert Home Mortgage Investment Corporation is not a financial advisor and we cannot advise you on making investments. There are risks to investing in real estate and the potential that you can lose all of your investment.